It's a pleasure to be here and uh, have this chance to share with you. Uh, I have some slides to show, but I hope uh, we can keep this very informal. And if you have questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or, or interrupt, and I'd be glad to try to answer them. If the slides are too small for you to see in the back, it'll be easier to sit on the side, and you know, also feel free to, to come forward. Uh, as Margarita said, what I was hoping to do today was to, uh, uh, because some of you may not know about Sandia Labs or the DOE laboratories in general, I thought I would uh, take a few minutes to just give you a little background and put that in context, and then to uh, share with you a little bit about the breadth of programs that we have in our global security efforts at Sandia, and then talk uh, a little more specifically about a few uh, projects that uh, occur in the department that I manage, which is the International Nuclear Threat Reduction Department at Sandia. So with that, we're going to just get started. <clears throat> just a quick history on Sandia Labs. It was actually established in the late 1940s as a spin-off of Los Alamos Labs on the Manhattan Project, which had developed the first nuclear weapons for the United States. And uh, President Truman wrote a letter to the chairman of the AT&T Corporation at the time, the telephone company, uh, asking if they could, uh, would be willing to operate an engineering laboratory on behalf of the government. And uh, there's a phrase which you can't read here, but it says, in my opinion, you have an opportunity to render exceptional service in the national interest. <clears throat> and that has been kind of the ethos or the the motto of Sandia ever since, which is to work on a variety of uh, important national security problems. Um, just to uh, get out of the way some of the number parts of this, uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of a size of organization that Sandia is, we actually have about 11,000 people on site of which about 5,000 are technical staff. Uh, the majority of them, if you can Probably can't read these in the back, but these are engineering, electrical, computer, mechanical, other engineering fields. So sort of two-thirds of our uh, technical professional staff are in the engineering fields. And then a number of scientists as well, all kinds of you know, physics, chemistry, biology, computer science, and so forth. But, uh, a very high degree of engineering uh, focus in the history of the lab. And that has that had its origins in our support for the weapons program, but it's been applied to the whole range of missions that the lab now services. <clears throat> because this is a little bit of a different structure that doesn't exist, uh, it's not well understood in the United States and it doesn't exist in a lot of other countries, this idea of uh, federally funded research and development uh, organizations, FFRDCs, um, or sometimes also known as GOCOs, government-owned contractor operated facilities. So Sandia is a basically a government-owned laboratory that is managed under a contract by private industry. And currently, it's Lockheed Martin Corporation has the contract to operate Sandia on behalf of the Department of Energy and the US government. Um, there's a whole set of regulations and rules and contracts that are um, in place for that. In similar ways, Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore Labs, that I'm sure you've heard of and others as well, also have similar arrangements where they're operated by private uh, entities on behalf of the government. Sandia has a number of geographic locations. Our primary site and where I live and work is in Albuquerque, New Mexico in the southwest deserts of the United States. Um, we have a site uh, across the street from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories that provides a lot of engineering support for the work that goes on at, at Lawrence Livermore. Um, and then we have some scattered other sites around the country. In uh, Kauai, we run a, a, a test range there, uh, do some missile launches and things from there. Uh, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, we provide some of the geologic support for the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant Project, which is there. Um, and we support other government missions in uh, uh, weapons, nuclear weapons related work in uh, Pantex in Amarillo, Texas, as well as at the Nevada test site, which is where we used to do underground nuclear testing. That has been uh, not going on now for probably 20 years or so, but we do other kinds of uh, non-nuclear testing and uh, field testing at that site. So we have these number of geographic locations where the laboratory does its work. 
at the core of our work are a lot of the science and engineering foundations that support uh, all of the missions of the laboratory. Um, and we've highlighted a few here that are some of the specialty areas of Sandy, including computing and information science, where we do a lot of um, you know, both computer architectures, computer design, uh, software development for high-speed uh, processing that's required for many of the missions of the laboratory. A lot of work in material science, including uh, uh, development of new materials, uh, single atom layer materials, and things at the cutting edge of, of science uh, these days. A lot on micro and nano devices, so uh, micro machines and things. You may have seen these on uh, news programs or magazines, but on a, kind of a, something the size of a, a square centimeter computer chip, they can have little gears and motors and all kinds of uh, active parts, and these become elements in everything from computer security to um, medical devices that can be implantable and so forth. And so it's a, a specialty area the lab focuses on. Engineering sciences are thermal and fluid sciences and things that support uh, everything from uh, energy production and geology and studies of that nature to uh, uh, wind, and, wind and solar energy and so forth. Uh, a lot of work on geoscience, both for uh, uh, waste repositories, for uh, energy development. And then the radiation science area is another one that we uh, have a lot of specialty work on including the world's largest uh, x-ray producing machine, uh, the Z machine, that uh, is used for all kinds of materials testing and uh, possible future of fusion energy as an example of how that's used. And then the bioscience area, and I'll talk more about some of these as we go, but uh, biosciences, Sandy is working to take some of these kinds of technologies in the micro realm and developing new bio sensors, bio uh, detectors, handheld devices, uh, looking at bio for future energy production, biofuels, for instance, as well as working in a, from a security standpoint on issues of uh, biosecurity as it relates to non-proliferation and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the, some of the uh, primary mission areas of the laboratory, as I mentioned, the lab had its origins as one of the, the engineering lab for the U.S. nuclear weapons program and development. And we continue to support uh, the U.S. nuclear stockpile with uh, ensuring the safety and reliability uh, of the current stockpile. And so uh, as weapons are aging and need to be uh, refurbished and things, that's part of the role of Sandia. We haven't been building new weapons for a long time, but we're maintaining the, the U.S. nuclear deterrent as it's coming down in numbers. Uh, there's still a need to maintain what we have, and that's uh, one of the key roles that Sandia continues to play. We also support a number of missions of uh, the U.S. Defense Department, uh, everything from developing of what's called synthetic aperture radar, which is a way to uh, image uh, the ground, with, uh, through the clouds or at night. Uh, it's a really interesting technology and you can see very small differences that occur um, as a result of uh, using this type of technology. So you can detect changes that occur on the ground quite readily. We've supported uh, the work of NASA when they were flying the space shuttle. Uh, you probably all heard about some of the tragedies that NASA had in the loss of the space shuttle. Uh, in one case, it was a case of the uh, heat shield tiles uh, having a little gap between them and hot gases getting in there as a result of vibrations that occurred during launch and it required that uh, it caused the loss of that shuttle and part of the program to go back to flight was actually developing uh, one of these synthetic aperture radar kind of technologies that Sandy had developed and it was put on a one of the manipulator arms of the shuttle every time after a shuttle went into orbit they took the manipulator arm in our radar system and went, did a scan under the entire vehicle to see if there were any gaps or any of the filler material had come out so that they could be assured that they could do re-entry successfully, which they were able to do in all the subsequent missions. Um, we do work in support of uh, other missions, sending out sensors, doing test flights of uh, 
missiles to test uh, missile defense technologies and so forth. So a number of work, uh, work areas like that as part of the defense missions. In the area of energy and climate, um, infrastructure security, I mentioned a lot of work that we do in solar and wind energy, including some of the early work in developing central receiver heliostat systems for uh, large-scale energy production. Uh, climate modeling, a lot of work modeling the whole domestic infrastructure of the United States so that we can understand the implications of everything from terrorism to hurricanes or major storms and what the impact is on the country and how to best manage those systems to minimize the disruption uh, to the country. Uh, and then other enabling technologies in the areas of uh, science and computer modeling. And then getting closer to home where I work and where the focus of my talk is going to be is in this area of international homeland and nuclear security. And here we do work uh, in support of critical asset protection. This is everything from understanding aging aircraft and how to keep uh, the planes we fly in safe and detecting little cracks and things before they become uh, catastrophes to uh, protecting the electric power grid and the energy supplies of the United States against uh, disruptions of, of various kinds. Uh, Homeland Security, since uh, really that became a focus after 9-11 and uh, has become a, a, another key mission area of the laboratory. And then global security, which is where I work and where a lot of our uh, work that I think would be of most interest to you uh, lies. So that's just kind of a quick uh, snapshot of the diversity of things and with the technical focus, a wide range of, of issues that are important to the country. As far as global security challenges, we worry about uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, non-proliferation issues, arms control, and we do it from this intersection of nuclear, chemical, and biological threats. And actually, I would add to that you know, radiological and even uh, delivery system issues like missiles and so forth. We, address all of those kinds of issues. Our, uh, our center, uh, which is the Sandia Center for Global Security and Cooperation, our goal is uh, you know, a lofty one, seeking a safe, secure world through global technical engagement. So, uh, you know, we all have different approaches to how we come at this, and uh, our focus is trying to take our technical backgrounds and knowledge of technology and apply it in ways that will further the cause of, of peace and security in the world. And uh, we try to do it through enabling global capacity. So working with people like yourselves and others around the world to try to enhance the capabilities, the understanding of the role that technology can play in furthering security around the world. Uh, but it requires this technical expertise, and so it becomes kind of a cycle as we um, as we learn what the needs are, we can better use and apply our technical needs to uh, the building greater capacity. And so we do it through uh, both research projects, development, applied, applied science, and applied engineering projects. As I said, we our lab was started in the late 1940s, and we've really had a long history of involvement in uh, the, the issues of the day, I'll call them, I guess, uh, as far as national security were concerned. So uh, in the Cold War era, you know, we uh, did everything from develop some of the space sensor platforms that were used to detect uh, nuclear testing in the atmosphere uh, that helped us enable implementation of uh, atmospheric test ban treaties. And uh, uh, in the post-Cold War era, um, you know, we worked a lot in cooperative programs in the former Soviet Union with uh, Russia and the former Soviet states to help secure nuclear materials there and bio and chemical programs uh, to minimize the risks of uh, terrorism or other events occurring as a result of that. In the post 9-11 era, as I mentioned, we do a lot of work on homeland security, everything from cybersecurity to physical security of all of the infrastructures of the country and, uh, and the, the continuing worries about non-proliferation around the world. Just a few pictures here, you probably recognize President Kennedy there um, on a visit in the early 1960s to Sandia to observe one of the satellites that was being prepared for launch that later went on to enable the U.S. to sign some of the treaties with the Soviet Union on uh, limiting atmospheric nuclear testing. And we really couldn't 
uh, do this. Generally, you can't do a treaty unless you're uh, super trusting of the other side or unless you have a means for verifying compliance with the treaty. And so a lot of the role that technology plays is in helping to verify uh, those, those technical treaties, including, and there's a whole list that you can't read there, but the Limited Test Ban Treaty, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the InfoCERC uh, 225, which is the IEA document for physical security of nuclear facilities. Uh, the INF Treaty was one, it's the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, you may have heard about, that was in the late 80s between the US and the Soviets, in which we banned an entire class of intermediate range missiles, uh, primarily intended to reduce the chance of nuclear war in Central Europe between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. And the monitoring systems associated with that were, were designed and developed, uh, demonstrated at Sandia, then packaged and sent to the Soviet Union where they were employed for a 25-year treaty period at Fokinsk, which was a missile production plant uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and then a number of others, including Biological Weapons Convention and others. In the post-Cold War era, we continued to supply uh, some of the technical support for the U.S. implementation of subsequent START treaties, you know, START 1, START 3, New START, um, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, CTR program, so-called, uh, primarily with Russia, again, trying to work to reduce the threat from nuclear materials uh, and biological materials that existed there. The Chemical Weapons Convention, the CWC is another one that we've uh, developed training tools and worked with the OPCW and other organizations to try to help implement their uh, capabilities in, in doing chemical inspections. And then again, in the post 9-11 era, this uh, picture, actually, this large cask or canister you see in the background, this was a, a large effort funded by the US to move a large amount of weapons-grade uranium across Kazakhstan from a not-so-secure location to a more secure location. And so that was done by these uh, large canisters uh, by rail across uh, much of the country of Kazakhstan, this so-called the N350 program. Um, but a lot of cooperation, you know, on these programs. So it involves technology, but it also involves development of trust, development of cooperation, working together to achieve um, programs that were going to enhance security for the countries themselves, plus for the world. So in our efforts to uh, build global capacity, we, we look for enduring partnerships, uh, policy engagement, system solutions that uh, can be useful. And from a technical expertise standpoint, we sometimes are trying to work at the cutting edge of new kinds of sensors and technologies and how do we apply microsystems or something to this problem. We also do systems analysis, trying to better understand problems, see where the, um, the biggest leverage points are and trying to make a difference. And then developing a solution, uh, system solutions with, uh, with an engineering in mind. And I'll show you examples of, of what each of these kind of mean in practical ways. As far as enduring partnerships, uh, here's just a few examples. Uh, this top one is called the International Training Course on Physical Protection. This is something that Sandy has been doing for probably <coughs> close to 30 years now for the International Atomic Energy Agency. And we bring people from around the world, uh, nations that have nuclear power uh, facilities, and we bring them to a multi-week training class at Sandy and expose them to a wide variety of uh, technologies, systems analysis tools, uh, policies and regulations and recommendations for how to better secure uh, the nuclear materials and facilities that they have in their countries. And this is, as I say, a really enduring program that's been going on for since the early 1970s, I would say. A more recent example is something we call the Gulf Nuclear Energy Infrastructure Institute. And this is something that we manage out of my department uh, as you may know, the United Arab Emirates are in the process of building a number of nuclear power plants. They've procured them from uh, Korea, and they're having the Koreans install them for them. Uh, but at the same time, they're sort of in parallel building their whole nuclear energy infrastructure of the country. And while they hire a lot of outside uh, people,
people to come in and, and do a lot of the work within the country, it's important that they manage some of these enterprises themselves. So they've stood up an energy company, the Emirates Nuclear Energy Company, a, a security arm of their nation that protects the infrastructure associated with this, uh, it's Coastal Protection Agency, Critical Infrastructure and Coastal Protection Agency. And they also have established a, uh, a regulator, so the Federal Agency for Nuclear Regulation. And so what we've done is worked with uh, a partner entity in the U.S., Texas A&M University, their nuclear engineering department, along with um, Khalifa University of Science and Technology in Abu Dhabi to create a fundamentals course on nuclear safety, security, and safeguards that we teach to the Emirati officials who are in the process of running or operating these entities within their country. Uh, and that's been a, a program that we're working to transition to uh, indigenous responsibility within the UAE. So eventually the Emirates will run this program themselves, but for now we're providing subject matter expertise for that. We also have a, uh, a long history of a visiting scholar program in which uh, individuals from many countries in the world come and spend a period of time with us at Sandy and we introduce them to technologies, uh, the, the role that they can play in uh, helping further the causes of non-proliferation uh, regional security arms control within their countries. I'm pleased to see my colleague Faroz Khan has joined us and Faroz was an example of a visiting scholar that we had a number of years ago at Sandia. He uh, spent some time with us uh, as part of that, that program and we've had a number of uh, folks since then. Uh, for policy engagement, you know, we again work across the spectrum of biochem, nuclear, radiological, but one example people may not think about is the veterinary aspect, animal, animal medicine. But you know, animal populations are really critical for uh, the economies of a lot of countries. They're critical for the food supply of a lot of countries, and so something disrupting that uh, could be just as uh, impactful as uh, you know a lot of human pathogens and diseases. And so we work with veterinary medicine people around the world to help them better be aware of the, some of the potential dangers of uh, animal pathogens and keeping a security aspect to that. Um, as I mentioned, we've had tech people that have done the technical support for the U.S. government in developing our treaty positions on moving forward with things like New START, where we're continuing to reduce the arsenals of nuclear weapons between ourselves and Russia. Um, another program, uh, GTRI, you may have heard that acronym, it's the Global Threat Reduction Initiative, and it is an effort to uh, help secure the radiological materials that exist around the world. Uh, many radiological materials are used in medical applications, if you have medical tests, for instance. Uh, they're used for a lot of industrial purposes, like inspecting the integrity of a weld between two pipes or looking for oil underground, they use certain kinds of neutron logs and so forth. And so, um, but the, the, historically there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on security, but in the current uh, climate of concern for terrorism and things, people are very worried about the idea of a dirty bomb, you've probably heard of, and that's the idea of scattering uh, radiological materials that make an area uninhabitable uh, perhaps over the long term cause, you know, human fatalities. Uh, and so we're working with countries around the world to add enhanced security to their industrial and medical and other radioisotopes. As far as system solutions, um, we are looking for ways, uh, one of the things we're interested in from a non-proliferation standpoint, um, is detecting nuclear materials that might be being smuggled as part of normal commerce. And every day and every year into the U.S. there are millions of containerized cargo shipments that come in from all over the world. Um, China being probably one of the foremost in terms of the, all the imports that we get from, from countries, but it's true from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Europe, from Japan, uh, many, many containerized cargoes. The concern is, what if somebody's smuggling a nuclear weapon or nuclear material in one of those cargos? Well, 
the economics of commerce are such that you can't afford to slow down the flow of commerce or something like this. So we've worked, and I'll show another picture later of some efforts, but trying to, to work with equipment that's currently in use at ports and ports of entry to, as it's going through its normal flow, to be able to gain extra information by putting a nuclear monitor, a nuclear sensor on this. And so as you're moving it around the port, you have some time to be able to measure um, the characteristics of that. Hopefully in that process, try to detect any illicit nuclear materials that might be smuggled. Um, chain of custody project is, is one that's really designed to look at the next stage of arms control between the United States and Russia. When we each had ten, tens of thousands of weapons, if we were off a little bit and somebody cheating, it didn't make a huge difference because we still had such a large arsenal. But as we move to smaller and smaller numbers, it's going to be important to have a better idea of how many nuclear warheads each side really has. Um, as you may know from your studies here, the uh, historically our arms control between U.S. and Russia or U.S. and Soviet Union was really not about the nuclear warheads as much as it was about the delivery vehicles. We were controlling bombers, submarines, missiles, and the way they were configured. That's what was being controlled because those were things you could see from outer space. You could, you know, have more ability to measure those. But as you get to smaller numbers, um, it's going to be important to understand um, and perhaps monitor the warheads themselves. And so as you do that, that presents all kinds of security challenges, and it presents challenges in tracking the information to know, is this the thing that I saw last week? And so the, these projects are kind of experimental projects to say, in the future of arms control, as we move to smaller and smaller numbers, how can we be sure, what is the chain of custody? How do we know where this weapon started, where it ends, what its whole life is in between? So that we know what our own are, and we know what the other sides are, and we can have a better confidence in agreeing to smaller and smaller numbers of, of weapons until we someday reach the, the NPT goal of you know, the world without the great weapons. Um, in the biosafety and security, that we've done a lot of work on, uh, this is just one example from Kenya and Uganda and Africa, where they're looking at um, various layers of information to try to better understand the, the bio implications uh, and disease patterns and animal patterns that are in these countries to decide where the greatest needs are. Uh, from an R&D standpoint here again, uh, this is a kind of a little bit of a repetition, but this device here called the Mobile Radiation Detection and Identification System or this, is this device that Sandy developed, which has embedded in it um, nuclear detectors that are of a, what we call a smart design. Um, if you're just measuring a radiation signature as you would with a simple Geiger counter, you run into a risk that there are a lot of materials that have a radioactive signature. And these can be things like fertilizer, like kitty litter, like certain kinds of ceramic materials. And if you're triggering on every one of those, then you're going to be really disrupting commerce. But if you can do a more sophisticated nuclear detection that provides you details of the particular materials that you're trying to be most concerned about, like uranium or plutonium, then you can uh, minimize the impact on commerce while you're, while you're um, doing these measurements. And so this device is designed, if you drive trucks through it, or it drives over trucks or canisters and is able to measure for these uh, radioactive signatures. We're in the process of developing new tamper-indicating ceramic seals. You can see the little computer chip on the top. Um, but a whole variety of technologies that will be sort of the next generation of understanding what's happened to something in the time that you're not there watching it. So if you, for instance, have a barrel that has bolts holding the lid on, you can have computerized bolts, if you will, that know that if they've been torqued or can send a signal if somebody's tampering with it, that sort of thing. So trying to make more of an active technology uh, with that kind of uh, approach. Uh, this device here called the Spin DX is a, a small, again, uh, micro electronic device 
that is uh, designed to do a biodetection and a biocharacterization or chemical detection characterization. So they can make small um, drift tubes and things out, out, of, uh, out of a semiconductor device and be able to do uh, phase separation of materials and, and have it respond to different characteristics. There are different ways to weigh these things with acoustic resonance, surface waves, and a number of different technologies that can be used to provide greater fidelity to the bio and chemical materials that we might be concerned about. So this is sort of a research effort. From a systems analysis standpoint, again, uh, various models on vulnerability and prioritization modeling. Where do you want to put your resources? You know, where everybody is, is resource constrained and limited, and so if you understand what the nature of the threat is, uh, within the threat, what is the, the most item of greatest concern to you, where is that located, how many of them are there, those kinds of things can help you better prioritize the assets that you have available to, uh, to deploy against a particular threat. We also are looking at questions of zero, nuclear zero and global stability. You know, I'm sure some of you have re researched some of this in your own studies, but you know, what happens, um, we talked this morning in a discussion we had about some of the paradoxes that occur about sharing information versus keeping information secret, which, you know, which is to your advantage. Um, it can vary on the circumstances. And the same thing as you go to nuclear, nuclear zero, everyone thinks zero, and that's the stated goal of the countries of the world and the non-proficient treaty, but how do you get there in a way that doesn't cause instabilities because there's an imbalance that occurs if you're off a little bit as you get to smaller and smaller numbers. So these are examples of, of studies that that we conduct. Uh, and then again, there are techniques for radiation detection equipment for warhead treaty verification. How could we, um, if we got access, say, to a Russian nuclear weapon as part of a treaty or agreement, what would we be allowed to see about that? What would we let them see about our own? It doesn't reveal classified information, and yet still allows us to, to be confident that, that they're showing us a nuclear weapon and that they're dismantling a nuclear weapon versus something that's not. And so finding ways with um, some kind of diode of information control, for instance, that the machine maybe detects it all, but we only see a subset of the information coming out to protect some of the classified information. That's kind of research um, systems engineering approach that we're working on. Uh, bio risk assessment models, uh, bio RAM, how much threat is there from bio uh, given various parameters that, that can be altered and, and try to assess how you best control that. Uh, we're working with the Chinese on a program that they're developing to have a center of excellence on physical protection. They're built in China and they're basing a lot of our work in the facilities that we have in San Diego. Um, it's our interest in building these kinds of centers of excellence and expertise around the world to help in uh, you know, furthering the causes of uh, arms control, non-proliferation, and regional security in general. As this map unfolds, it's just you see more and more countries getting highlighted, but this is sort of the representative of the countries that we have worked with over the years and how it's increased progressively over the decades. Um, something over 120 countries now that we've had uh, that we've either hosted visitors, we've been to those countries training people, um, we've hosted scholars from those countries and so forth. And I, I was even told recently that we actually did have a visitor from Greenland, so we get to become a big yellow spot over there. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, around the world, and, and of course the subject matter varies by, by country, like some, some of these are bio, some are chem, some are nuclear, some are all the above. But we, we've had a very extensive um, set of interactions. So much like the Monterey Institute, you know, we're used to working with uh, a number of cultures, a number of backgrounds, and uh, find that a really challenging, interesting part of the work that we get to do. Just show you a few more uh, specific examples of some of the things mostly in my department, and some of those I've showed you already were, but uh, I mentioned the Monterey uh, Fellows Program, and, uh, the Don. Oh, Maria, this was the spring group, yep, that was there. And uh, 
Uh, so three times a year, uh, in a collaborative program with uh, Margarita and her folks here, we bring uh, some of the visitors from, from Monterey to, to Albuquerque and they spend a month or so with us there, uh, getting exposed to technology and the role that it plays in the studies that they're working on. And so it provides a, a, a little bit of a different perspective. And then they take those results uh, with them to Washington, D.C., and we arrange for them to present their work to uh, policy folks. Uh, some other recent visits we've had, we had a group from the Jordan Atomic Energy Commission, a group of Indian graduate students in their radiation sciences areas that, that came through, and we're planning in the near term later this year a couple of new themed workshops, one on something called root cause analysis. And um, root cause analysis just really means what is the underlying basis for some problem that occurs. Usually root cause analysis is done after there has been an accident or a tragedy. So I mentioned earlier the space shuttle. When the space shuttle explodes on re-entry, uh, they go back and do a root cause analysis. What went wrong? What, what could we have done differently? What we, should we have known? Um, and what our approach is, is that that's very useful. But the lessons learned from that, you can almost put it in reverse and say, run that kind of an exercise before there's an accident and say, what could go wrong? What might go wrong? What could we do now to prevent it from happening? And so getting people to understand both, both ways, how do you respond to an accident and how do you really use this mental thinking to prevent an accident in the first place? Also, the topic of uh, personnel security programs is another one we've been working on. You know, so many things we can do a lot with technology and sensors and badges and other, you know, secure devices. But in the end, you're, you're relying on people at some point. There's somebody who has the right knowledge, they have the access, they have everything they need. But if they're not a reliable person, if they're not somebody you can trust, um, then you might still have a problem. It's sort of, sort of the inside threat, if you've heard that term. So that idea. And so we're, we're trying to introduce this whole concept to people that you can't just necessarily rely on somebody because they're a friend or they're from the same tribe that you are or they're, you know, friends of the king or whatever the issue is, is not sufficient. But you might want to have some other criteria that you use to assess the reliability of that person. And so that's really an important part of, of security as well. I know a number of people here are interested in the topic of export control, and that's something that we work on as well. Um, we support programs both at the Department of Energy and the Department of State to help in um, training customs and border officials, uh, in some cases military officials, the people in countries that are responsible for looking at the cargo and the commerce that's coming and going from the country. And one of the things we're most interested in is introducing them to an awareness of what are called dual-use technologies. These are technologies that could have very legitimate commercial uh, or academic or other uses, but which in the wrong hands could be misused for development of a weapons of mass destruction program. And so, Many times, customs officials wouldn't have had the exposure to those kinds of materials or capabilities. And so we're working to make them more sensitized and aware of how some of these materials can be misused. So if you have a big shipment of parts that don't have anything to do with a particular business uh, that might have a weapon application, you want to know that. So you might start to question whether that's a legitimate shipment or not. Um, We're also working with the Egyptian Atomic Energy Authority uh, to help them establish what they're calling a center of excellence for uh, low-level or radioactive waste management. Uh, Egypt has research reactors, and a number of countries in the Middle East are developing nuclear power. And so, as in the United States, one of the big long poles in the tent, as we say, with respect to nuclear energy is what do you do with the nuclear waste? Um, it's something we're still struggling with in the United States. We don't have good solutions for it. Um, or the solutions we have technically aren't politically acceptable. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a dilemma. 
But what we're trying to work with the Egyptians on is to use them as a model for how to do this in their region. They can become a training ground for uh, other countries from the Middle East and North Africa to be able to come and uh, share their experience and their knowledge. And so we're in the process of helping them to establish that capability. Another example of a capacity building exercise that we have is with uh, also countries from the, what we call the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, on uh, this one called radiation monitoring cross calibration. The idea here is that um, if you detect something of a nuclear nature with a sensor, you want to know, and if somebody else detects it and they tell you about it, you want to know are they capable of making that measurement? Can I believe the measurement they got? Would I have gotten the same measurement? And so what we've done is we've created a, a network of folks from the region that now uh, they're sent samples by the DOE regularly uh, that are known uh, calibrated samples. And then they're asked to evaluate those samples. And then they meet annually to come together to share results. It's not to find fault with anybody, but it's to sort of share best practices and to see how well they're doing at really matching sort of global standards for their ability to do this nuclear detection. And that's going to be very important in the future when you have nuclear accidents or, heaven forbid, a nuclear weapon or something and you get nuclear detections, you want to be sure that you can trust and rely on the information that's coming from partner countries. And so this is an effort to essentially enhance the laboratory measurement capabilities in these countries. We're also involved uh, a lot in what are called track two processes. I think most of you probably are familiar with that terminology, but um, track one processes are sort of government to government official dialogues. Track two processes are uh, less formal, less structured. They may have government people in non-government capacity, so they're presenting themselves, not their government, in meetings to talk about sensitive security issues. Um, or to explore what might not be politically feasible at an official level, but which you could talk about informally. Um, and we go to some of these meetings for the Middle East, for East Asia, and so forth, and we explore ideas like, how could you develop a, a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, and what would that take? Uh, that's something that's been called for in the NPT Review Conference, and they're having a real hard time politically doing it, but we've come up with some ways that you might be able to approach that in an incremental way to make progress rather than just all or none. Um, so those are examples of some ways that we inter interact there. Uh, I mentioned delivery systems, and one of the things we've been involved in supporting is uh, an effort to, uh, between India and Pakistan, to look at um, reducing the dangers associated with aging missile systems. Missiles are not unlike cars or televisions or anything else that's you know, man-made, over time they age, they break, they fall apart, they're not as reliable. And there's a concern that aging missiles, if you keep them in the inventory too long, they, you know, they might explode on yourself instead of on the enemy. Um, and so if you're going to get rid of a missile anyway because it's old, maybe you could do that in a cooperative way and start to be a step toward confidence building by, you know, inviting inspectors from the other side and say, okay, this is an old missile, we're retiring it, we're going to dismantle it and let you see how that's done. And so we've worked with uh, people from both countries to, uh, to explore this, this avenue and what, what are some approaches to that, how do you manage the access, if you're inviting somebody that you don't trust to your side, how could you, what could you show them and not show them and still achieve the goals of this kind of exercise. And, this is an example where Froze was instrumental in helping us uh, with this project as well. Um, those of you that have been to Sandia or will come to Sandia, um, this is our International Programs Building in Albuquerque. That's where we house our visiting scholars. It's uh, where our offices are located. And we have a number of facilities there in addition to the office space and conference facilities that we that are a little more unique. Um, and that's one of the advantages of people coming to see us. And one is our technology training and demonstration area where we have a collection of technologies that have been used historically in treaties or currently uh, in support of international agreements. We can show you and let you, you know, handle and touch and get familiarity with those technologies. 
we have some, uh, I don't call it outdoor test facility where we can do simulated border monitoring over wide open areas uh, in the deserts around Albuquerque there. We also have a nuclear security center of excellence that is a, uh, a former nuclear storage site, nuclear material storage site that is uh, now vacant from that, but has a lot of the security system associated with that uh, that we can use to demonstrate uh, physical security on a full-scale size. So the various fences and uh, sensor systems, uh, data control systems, uh, alarm systems, and so forth. Um, so a lot of chance to get practical experience and to see uh, in real time the kind of technologies that are used for those kinds of applications. Also about a dozen years ago, uh, we took the model of our cooperative monitoring center at Sandia and we transplanted it to the Middle East, to Iran, Jordan. And we had established, uh, we used to call it the cooperative monitoring center, CMC Adamon. And then a few years ago, it was, uh, a few years ago, uh, it was rebranded as the Middle East Scientific Institute for Security. So this is now a Jordanian NGO. It's located at the Royal Scientific Society campus, which is like a national lab in Amman, Jordan. And they have a facility similar to what we do in Albuquerque on a smaller scale of technology displays, conference rooms, facilities and subject matter experts from their national lab that can be used to facilitate meetings uh, in the Middle East. So if you're going to hold a, a conference of some kind and it has some of these elements of uh, border security, energy, environment kinds of, uh, this is a, a venue that's available and geared to exactly that, bringing in foreign nationals from around the world to, to host a meeting. And if they need to do it in Arabic or something, they have the facilitators that can accommodate that. This is sort of an overly busy chart here, but it just says that um, Sandia really is involved in the full spectrum of technologies and approaches to support our national security mission from uh, national nonproliferation systems that are more on the support of the U.S. government only side all the way through uh, cooperative programs in a negotiated sense in, in support of treaties that we have either with the international community or with specific countries all the way to these cooperative threat reduction programs and other confidence building programs that we have that uh, work together with other countries in a very partnership way to achieve uh, a mutual objective. So as we look ahead, um, you know, technology is constantly evolving. If you don't believe that, just see how old your phone is if you've had it for more than a year or something. Uh, things just keep changing and so we need to keep up with using technology in appropriate ways. We also have to worry about how technology can be used against us. So um, people find new ways to use technology, both for good and for bad. And so being aware of new technology and the impacts and usefulness of it are, is a key part of what we do. And then new partnerships. So hopefully from our meeting today and future meetings uh, we have with, with yourselves and others like you that will develop new relationships and partnerships and find ways to, uh, to work together to collaborate address some of these most challenging problems in the world. So that's all I was going to present.